Welcome to the Daily Update, where I'll go over the action in the market for Wednesday, August 7th, and then we'll see how things look for Thursday, August 8th. Had a nice solid start to the day, and it looked like, okay, this little bounce that we saw on Tuesday is going to carry over into Wednesday. Well, it kind of fizzled out, started to turn, come down, we ended up closing lower. Now, that lines up more with what we're seeing on our charts right now in the short and intermediate term that we are still negative and we remain negative. The hope, if you're positive on the market, is that things were starting to improve. We were seeing some signs that potentially things are getting better. Well, we're not really seeing that right now and we're actually back to more negative. If you take it in the bigger context, we're still positive in the long term. And we're becoming more oversold again. And sometimes that can produce a bounce. But until we see confirmation of things actually switching back positive, we still remain negative overall. Before I get started, please know I do have the SPX investing program. I'm going to be locking that down as soon as I get some logistics worked out here. If you want to find out more about it, there's a link in the description below this video, as well as a link to some videos that explain the program. And here's an email address that you can contact me with if you desire to do so. The daily video that you're watching right now is the main focus of the analysis that I do. All of the other videos around the outside, they're typically weekly videos, except for the supplemental videos. I do those on an as-needed basis. But to really get a some insight as to what's happening. The daily videos are really what should be the focus. All right, let's go back and talk about what happened. Didn't have much of a gap, but we did have a higher open and prices were able to get above R1 at 5304. And we were kind of battling around that 5300 level. So it thought, all right, maybe if we can get above that, things can actually turn a bit more positive. But then prices ended up declining down below R1. As the day went on, we just continued to decline. It looked like, okay, and I made a post about this on the website. We were coming down. We were just about ready to hit the daily pivot at 52.49. And then the real kind of line in the sand is the unchanged level. On an up day, that tends to act as a support level. And if we break through that, that's when things are switching more negative. That means we're also going negative as far as the index is concerned. And we did go negative and we closed down at 5,200. So we tried to battle with 5,300. We ended up being down at 5,200. We were down 0.77% and volume is still above average. So I'm kind of doing away with this idea that the dog days of summer with July and August really seeing volume tapering off, which that still could happen. We still are in the early stages of August. But this drifting lower of volume just isn't happening. You got a lot of folks that are really paying attention to what's going on right now and doing a lot of trading both in and out. We are negative in the short and intermediate term, but we're oversold. We're still positive in the long term. Are we going to go down and test that 200-day moving average? We'll have to see if something like that unfolds. We're not really getting much in the way of economic reports this week that help us with the inflation and interest rate scenario, but the market is still adopting more of this, wait a minute, instead of the economy just slowing down, and that's why the Fed will lower rates, maybe there's actually economic growth that is slowing down that could eventually put us into a recession, and that's changing the scenario over and making it more negative. And then all the different geopolitical things. We've got a lot of unrest still happening in England. We've got all the political things happening in the U.S. We've got the Olympics going on. I think they're still going on. I haven't been watching them this year. And then the potential escalation of things in the Middle East, which we kept hearing this could happen today, and then the next day could happen today, and then the next day could happen today. So... We're just kind of waiting to see if anything is, is going to escalate between Iran and Israel. Okay, some comments. We did see an early advance and a late-day decline. It's the amateurs who open the market. It's the professionals who close it. And the professionals decided to do some selling. We have a pretty long list here in the short term. 
with the ADX is kind of coming down. The red line is, it, it actually declined even though we had a down day. But the Stoke RSI, the Williams Percent R, that's back on the list now. The CCI 14 and 20, the stochastics, the rate of change going back five periods, the force index, the slope oscillator, all of our oscillators are negative. The boom indicator based on 20 periods, and then it was on the list and off the list. Now back on the list is the RSI based on nine periods. Also, we're keeping an eye on the intermediate term ADX, as well as the rate of change going back 20 periods, the ease of movement, the chicken money flow, and then the boom indicators showing that we're getting kind of far away from the 50 period moving average. And then this idea that the market is really anticipating a rate cut in September. They've priced that in at 100%. It's what is the amount going to be? And then if things end up switching and the Fed doesn't end up cutting rates, oh my gosh, what is that going to do to the market? Because the Fed is supposed to do what the market's already telling it to do. But over the last few years, especially since the COVID lockdowns, and especially since quantitative easing has come back into the picture at different times over the last 15, 20 years or so, actually, it was out of the picture. It came into the picture. This means that the Fed is kind of leading the markets. And so it's the reverse of typically how it has been and typically how it should be, but it is what it is for right now. The dollar was up and interest rates were also up. We're getting back up close to that 4% level again. We closed at 3.97% with a 10-year yield where we had been at 3.89%. Still inverted with the yield curves. Sentiment is still extreme negative. We actually ticked down just one notch. We had been at 21. We're still at 20. When we get down to this level where we're below 25, that's when we start to look at using this as a contrarian indicator but we're just not seeing any follow through yet, at least more than what we saw on Tuesday, as far as confirmation that things look to be recovering. Our trend is negative. The ADX is above its moving average. And with the down day, we're negative and the momentum is now negative. Okay, we just had the weekly MBA mortgage applications index, which came in at 6.9%, where last week it was down 3.9%. And here is a chart of that. Not a major thing by any means. This is just something I like to keep an eye on. And it comes out every week. So we're not seeing a real lag in the data like we do in some of the other economic reports. Then Isabel Net blog charts, the 37-week rate of change, where... You look over here, and we are starting to come down a little bit here. This had been really going up, showing good, solid momentum. But we're getting to what they call a sell signal now, where we hit one of these red lines because we're, we're getting to a pretty high reading as of when this chart was created. And that's longer term, and that could be negative. And then I didn't put this in the seasonality section because there's a typo or something wrong with this chart. It's a Carson cycle composite for the S&P. I don't know how they do this. They take all their different cycles and jam them together. But it suggests a buying opportunity in March. Well, great. I mean, back here is March, but we're in August now. So I'm not quite sure what they were trying to say by this. This is more the summertime. Maybe they meant this could be a good buying time. It would be after October, but we still have some real bumpy ways to go along the way. So I'm I'm not really sure what to make of this chart. And then the S&P 500 annual peak top to trough bottom declines. When you put this in the perspective of other declines that we've seen, even though we were falling down on Monday and we got close to that 10%, we ended up being down about 8% according to this measurement. It's still below the median that we see. And that, <clears throat> that's what I was watching on Monday. That's why I decided not to open any additional Barrett's positions on Monday. Then I didn't on Tuesday because we had an up day. I did on Wednesday, though, because we ended up having a down day and we're still looking negative. But people want to just freak out and all re overreact to what's going on, where really we haven't come down to the median of what we typically see. And even in solid, positive environments, we still see pullbacks and even declines during those times. And then the median monthly flow into equity mutual funds. Now, I know a lot of folks are not necessarily doing mutual funds as much anymore, but this also shows ETFs where 
we look at the month of August where this is when people tend to take money out. Maybe they're going on vacation or something and they've been saving up for that magical trip. And then until the summer, the S&P had one of the best starts ever. This is the orange line. Well, July was good. It's just that August, we're starting to run into some problems here. Where the dark blue line, this is the median. This is what typically will happen going back to 1928. And then the two-year treasury yield, if you push it ahead, and again, I like to look at these charts, but I don't use them to make decisions. It leads by 20 weeks and suggests the Fed is behind. Okay, you can put any kind of thing together and either justify what the Fed is doing or what they're not doing. On a down day, they're screaming for an emergency cut. On an up day, they're like, oh, everything's just fine. But this might suggest that things are starting to fall off with the two-year yield if you push it forward and then line it up with the Fed funds rate. All right, then looking at money going into or out of different sectors, even though there's more than 11 here because they have the total at the top, then we have ETFs in the middle. And then mixed in with all of this are the 11 different sectors where we're still seeing an awful lot of money going in last week. And then we have the four-week average as well. And we see a lot of money right now going into ETFs itself. And I'd like to explain this from time to time, and I hit this in the course that I teach too, that when the market is really trending up or trending down, passive investing by just getting into an S&P ETF or mutual fund, they tend to do better. When the market's starting to hit difficult times, then the actively managed either mutual funds or ETFs tend to do better because the actively managed ones, they can maneuver things where you're just riding the index if you're in more of a passive type of investment. But this just shows you money going into consumer services, discretionary, healthcare, more defensive there. The financials, they're actually seeing some money taken out here over the four weeks, but money coming back in as the financials are doing better. And a lot of money going into ETFs, but also a lot of money over the last four weeks they have been putting more into that, where some of the more negative areas are here at the bottom with energy, tech, utilities, and industrials. All right, and then looking at the risk appetite here, where we had fallen down to kind of a low level, and this may end up being some kind of a contrarian indicator when folks are getting really negative. Now, we could still drop lower than this, but when folks are getting very pessimistic on the market, and we see that with our sentiment reading, that's the time when we look at, okay, maybe this is the time things might start to improve. And then looking at 5% pullbacks in the S&P have occurred three times a year going back to 1930. And this is the blue line right in here showing the average of 3.4%. And what we're seeing is not necessarily uncommon. I mean, I, markets just don't go straight up or straight down. They chop higher they and they chop lower. They tend to go down faster because people might spend a period of time buying and then sell all of that at once. And that's why we see the down moves usually have more intensity. But nothing is necessarily out of the order yet based on history i didn't everything that edward yardini was talking about i don't think really applied in his latest um post here to what we're talking about now i didn't really find anything interesting on twitter so let's go in and look at our charts where we did have a nice solid open it looked like okay we had that crazy day on monday but it looked like we were building a base and then it looked like we were coming up out of that base, even though we closed off of the high on Tuesday. And then it looked like, okay, maybe we're just going to be able to keep going. And we did have a higher open and we were able to help hold out above our one. But it's like all the buying just kind of fizzled up. We ended up dropping down to the daily pivot, came down to the unchanged level, tried to use that as a support level, bounced up a little bit, but then broke down below it. And we ended up closing at the low for the session where at the beginning of the day, we're battling the 5,300 level. Now we're just a little bit below the 5,200 level for the S&P. And we're not really showing much of a change now in the initial overnight session when we look at the intraday chart here. We still see the red line on top with the blue line underneath, although both are declining. And we're seeing a little bit more weakness now when we look at S&P growth of value intraday. 
And so growth was down more than value for the large caps, the mid caps, as well as the small caps. So it was not a good day for growth. And so our growth to value ratios for the small caps are still showing weakness as they are for the mid caps. And let's, oh, uh, there should be another chart in here. Oops, it was in the wrong spot. And we're just not seeing any strength of S&P growth to value either. We're keeping an eye on this growth versus value ETF where we're still continuing to be below the 250 day moving average. And that I'm seeing that more as negative right now, unless we can get back up into the rainbow. There's the other chart. And we're not seeing any real help now from discretionary versus staples either. Large cap growth, we're still above the 200 day moving average, but underneath the 100 day moving average, kind of right in between right now, as it was down almost a percent. And we tick back up here with small caps doing, actually large caps holding up a little bit better than small caps. With our trend, we're no longer above 40 with the ADX. It's coming down. But now we have the ADX going up, and it's not too far away from 40. We're above the moving average, showing that the trend is actually getting stronger, even though the red line did come down. It picked up more of the strength that it saw earlier in the day than the weakness that we saw and then plus that we closed down pretty much at the low for Tuesday's session. So the ADX really didn't pick that up. But this is still negative overall as it is in the short term. And volume, even though it's dropping down a little bit, it's still above average. Here we did get the latest reading from Investors Intelligence. They had been above four. That's when we start to get nervous. They dropped all the way down to 2.5. So now they're more in the middle area of things. The ulcer index continues to show an increase in fear, and we ticked up just a little bit with the closing value with the VIX, but still getting a very high reading at, we're above 27 here, and also showing how we're coming down with the VIX, but still very, very high than what we had been used to seeing. So we're ticking up just a little bit here with the VIX of the VIX, as well as the bar chart up above, and this is in... Also increasing the price of put options, which are protection, because when the VIX is going up, that means there's a lot of hedging going on here. So we're not really seeing a decrease in the VIX at this point. And seeing a higher VIX is typically what we do see seasonally and historically, and that's been what's happening lately. The momentum of the VIX continues to be up, and the VIX to move ratio is still very high. And we look at the move index by itself, where it's coming down a little bit. And we ticked up just a little bit here with the VIX, but the correlation between the volatility of bonds and stocks is still very high right now. We actually declined with the daily chart of the equity put call ratio, but we're still going up with the five day and the 10 day charts. Looking at the spread between risky and not as risky bonds, this is what we're keeping an eye on, mainly because of the next chart and in the middle area. To see this really going down, that means fear is increasing in the bond market. We want to see this come back down, and it's just not doing it at least yet. And then we did see an increase with this fear gauge and a little bit of an increase with this other fear gauge that we follow here. We're seeing the risk off start to really continue to show momentum here as folks are getting out of a risk on type position and getting more into a risk off position. That's more defensive. And volatility risk premium, which really had spiked up, is now coming back down into the band. And we did decline with the advanced decline line based on price as well as volume. But as I've been trying to point out, we're seeing a lot more intensity with the volume declining than we are with price. But for right now, you could also look at this and go, all right, we're, we're holding up. We're still above the moving averages here. And not really seeing much of a change here. With our 5 and 10 day, we are going down. But we actually saw more new highs than new lows. So we're not breaking out either way. And since we're in a more negative stance right now, this tends to be holding up fairly well. And we're seeing a mixed picture here with the blue line below the midpoint. The red line is still above the midpoint. So we're getting a mixed picture in the short and intermediate term with the advanced decline ratio. And we're still getting a really extreme negative reading with the boom indicator with accumulation distribution. It looked like, and I was trying to point this out, that maybe we were leveling out here, even with the solid down day that we saw on Monday. 
Well, in Wednesday's session, this shows that the smart money was actually doing some selling, but we are looking really extreme when we look at the boom indicator. And this also was potentially seeing some signs of improvement as we were going up at the chicken money flow. That's why I put the moving average on here. It's one thing to see this thing improve. It's another thing to see enough of an improvement to see the red line turning back up. And it never did that. And now we're seeing an even more extreme negative with the chicken money flow here. And we're starting to come back down with the chicken oscillator after it had been advancing. And we really dropped off with the cumulative NYSE advanced decline line here, but we're still holding up fairly well with the NYSE advanced decline line. Also holding up with this other NYSE advanced decline line. When we break it out with the NYSE common stock based on price, we were down just a little bit and we're holding up okay when we look at this based on volume. So it's the broader market that's hanging together. It's still the mega caps that are really causing some problems. And we ticked just a little bit here with the cumulative S&P 500 based on price. And we also ticked down just a little bit based on volume here. And when we look at the NYSE advanced decline line and compare it with the S&P, the red line's still on top. So it's holding up a bit better, even though they're on different scales. So a little bit of weakness here, but holding up fairly well with the advanced decline line studies coming back down a little bit below the moving average with the NYSE common stock. Decline, but above the moving average with the S&P, dropping below with the mid caps and looking a little better here, still above the moving average with the small caps. So not really much to show here as far as price is concerned. We're not really hitting any of these pivot levels that are causing much support or resistance. Down at the bottom, we are still above average with volume. And we're still looking oversold in the short term with the Stoke RSI being extreme negative. The Williams Percent R is back on the list. The CCI 14 and the CCI 20 are all extreme negative. The stochastics in the short term are looking extreme, intermediate term extreme, and not extreme, but not really doing much here with the long term stochastic. No longer extreme as much with the force index, but still quite negative. And we ticked down with the 20, 50, and 200 period moving average study for the S&P. The condition of the 20 period moving average is just not doing very well right now. And we're getting extreme with the rate of change going back five periods. <clears throat> this is an extreme negative reading. It looked like we might be trying to improve, but that didn't happen on Wednesday. We are showing a little bit of improvement here with the 10 day. We had come to a pretty negative reading and we're continuing to bounce up. And we're just right on the border between the minus two and minus three standard deviations channel. So we're not necessarily extreme there. And we were flat, but we're still negative with the balance of power. The condition of the 50 day moving average is still not looking very healthy. The go no go is negative. We're still battling the lowest low value. That's the red line here on this chart. The TTM squeeze is going down and continuing to get even more extreme negative. It's below this black line now, suggesting that in the intermediate term, we are oversold. And I forgot to put this on the list. And we're seeing a pretty extreme negative reading with the range rate of change going back 20 periods. That's the lowest reading that we've seen over the last year. Standard deviation continues to be going up as we're really moving around a lot these days. Ease of movement is bouncing up, but still negative and still looking rather extreme negative. The Arun is flat right now, but it's negative. And we're negative with the S&P McClellan oscillator and not extreme. So we're going down with the summation index based on price and volume. We were seeing this negative divergence in the shorter term where volume was going down while price was still going up. We're also keeping an eye on these longer term negative, diver negative divergences when we compare it to what the S&P has been doing. The NYSE McClellan oscillator ticked down a little bit, still below zero. That's negative. So we are declining based on price and volume with the summation index for the NYSE. And you could also make a case for these little longer term negative divergences that we're seeing here. The swing and trading oscillator is negative. We're below zero based on price and volume. And we tick down with the PMOs that are rising. The buy signals are going down and the PMOs above zero are also going down. And we're dropping further below the midpoint here with the PMO. We're negative based on price. We had been negative longer here based on volume. The parabolic SAR is, is negative with the dots on top. 
We're negative with the elders impulse system for the S&P with the red bars. We're still going down here with the slope oscillator and getting to an extreme negative reading. We're looking more negative with the MACD. So the reason I break these out, the slope is usually short term, where the MACD I treat as more short to intermediate term here. And both of those are looking negative. Then I put all of the oscillators on this chart with the short term looking quite negative now. We're also declining in the intermediate term and the long term. And we were not able to get above, well, we got above it, but we weren't able to stay above the 100 period moving average. This had been providing resistance on Tuesday when we saw the nice bounce. We got above it earlier in the session and then closed pretty much at the, the low for the day on the S&P. And that's usually not a good sign. So we're in between the 100 day moving average on top and the, we're, we haven't come down to the 200 yet, but that's still below current price. The Sean trend meter, it's trying to tick back up a little bit here, but it's pretty much neutral right now. And we're below 50 with the bullish percent index. That is turning more negative. We're also turning negative with the NYSE bullish percent index. We ticked up a little bit here with the NASDAQ 100 bullish percent index, but we're still negative since we're below 50. The money flow was flat, but we're below 50. That's negative. The ultimate oscillator is going back down. That's negative. The vortex sees the red line coming down, but it's still on top, so that is negative. We're below the moving average with on-balance volume, which is negative. The copy curve is measuring momentum as being negative. We're below 50 with the stocks inside the S&P above their 20-period moving averages. That's negative. We're also below with the 50-period study, and we're dropping back below again with the 100 study. We're declining, but still above 50 with the 200. And this is why the long-term trend is, this is one of the things that we look at for evidence to suggest that the long-term trend is still positive. If we drop below 50, that's when things are going to turn negative. And we're still waiting for the third part of this signal. The first two have been triggered with the mass index, but this continues to go up. When we finally do get the third signal, we'll want to see if there's the potential of a reverse happening. And we're still looking negative with the RSI 14, and we're starting to get extreme negative here with the RSI 9, the short-term RSI. And we're far away from the 20-period moving average and 50-period moving averages here with our boom indicator study, and we continue to decline, but above zero with the 200-period moving average study. And keeping an eye on these FIB levels, just in case we continue to fall, we got kind of close on Monday, but still a ways away. We'll be wanting to see if this is going to provide some support if we see more weakness. And we're coming back down into the, actually we dropped out of the cloud here with the Ichimoku cloud. This is a blow up here. We were able to get back up into the cloud on Tuesday. Now we're dropping back down below it. And we see the blue line is below the red line. That's negative. And we see the green line declining. So this is also suggesting things are not very positive right now. Coming back down and dropping below the 23.6% FIB extension here for the S&P. And this is still holding up, though. This R1 level, which is at 5110. My gosh, it, I was saying that number over and over and over months ago. We'll want to be watching this level if we see more downside here. But we're negative with the hike in ASHI. When we look at our different trends here, we're still pointing up, but we're negative with the Kigi chart. And the Ranko chart is negative, and the three-line break chart is also negative. Long term, we're seeing a little bit more weakness, but still above this midpoint here with the 150. Declined a little bit, but still looking okay with the 200-period moving averages. And then we're negative in the short term, where the NASDAQ 100 is negative in the short and intermediate term. So stocks are negative in the short term. Commodities are negative on all time frames, where the dollar continues to be negative in the short and intermediate term. And we saw utilities, energy, and financial being up, and then staples. Some of these can be said for being more defensive. And we had discretionary and tech really leading things lower in Wednesday's session. An awful lot of green or blue when the day started and then it turned to red. So just call it a Christmas day here. The equal weight is holding up a bit better than the S&P weighted index. Even though they're on different scales, the red line is still above the bar chart. And saw a little bit of a decline here 
with this ratio. Not really much of a change there. We're actually switching back a little bit more positive. We had gone negative with the new highs minus the new lows on the NYSE. Well, we had a positive reading after Wednesday, and that suggests the broader market's holding up a bit better. And we're still below the 50-day moving average with the Dow. We're negative with the diamonds, with the Elder's Impulse system. Still above the 200-day moving average with the NASDAQ, but it was down over a percent. Still above this S2 pivot level. We'll see if that ends up providing any support. The NASDAQ 100 also still above its 200-day moving average, but not all that far from it. We're negative with the Elder's Impulse system for the Qs. Momentum just continues to go down, and we're getting even more extreme negative here with the NASDAQ 100. And now we're seeing a cross. The 20 is crossing below the 50. That's really doing some damage to the short-term trend. But that happened again last April into May before we did see things look a little bit better. We're still above the 200-day moving average here. Are we going to go back and test that? And we're dropping down here out of this level again from all these FIB extensions for the Qs. The small caps still above their 200-day moving average, but they were down over a percent, dropping below this pivot point here. And we're getting kind of a low reading here with the Russell 2000 small caps getting close with the RSI to being extreme under the 50, but above the 200 when we look at the moving averages. But the momentum is negative for the small caps. Negative with the elders impulse system for the small caps. Right in between the 50 and 200 day moving average with the mid caps and still negative with the elders impulse system for the mid caps. Right in between the 50 and 200 with the Wilshire. So is this going to come down and potentially test the 200 day moving average? Another broad market measure. The total U.S. stock ETF also in between the 50 and 200 moving average now. The FANG index, we did bounce off the 200 day, and that was a sign of some potential hope. But we ended up having a good update on Tuesday, but we gave 1.29% back on Wednesday. And the staples to tech ratio is still going up. That means staples are outperforming tech right now, a more defensive type of posture. And small caps are kind of outperforming the tech sector. They're all having weakness right now. But this ratio did tick back up just a little bit and has been breaking out. Apple ended up being up one and a quarter percent, but still below its 50 day moving average. We're still below the 200 day moving average with Amazon. We're above the 200 day moving average with Google. And Microsoft is a little bit below its 200 day moving average. Meta is doing a well, it was down one and a half percent, right about at its 50 day moving average. And NVIDIA is right in between its 50 and 200 day moving average. It was down over 5%. Tesla was down 4.43% and dropping below both moving averages after recently generating a golden cross. And Netflix was up a third of a percent, but right in between both moving averages. Looking at the broad market, though, we're starting to turn negative here. This had been holding up. When we take a five-period moving average of the highs minus the lows across the Amex, NASDAQ, and NYSE, well, we're starting to see negative signs here. And we're still looking fairly strong with a short-term correlation between U.S. stocks and world stocks. And the longer-term correlation is continuing to improve as we're seeing more global weakness right now. The dollar is it actually bounced back up, and it's still in a longer-term uptrend. But it has been showing some real weakness lately. Oil bounced back up a little bit here, up 2.77% to the 75 range here. We're watching this to see if there's an escalation in the Middle East. Is oil really going to spike up? And I hadn't shown this, but we've been talking about it. This is the Japanese yen of the dollar. I usually show this in the intermarket analysis video over the weekend where the yen has been in a solid downtrend for a long time. And this is what was causing the problem here is the Japanese yen was really going up against the dollar. And that was forcing these high leveraged folks in Japan and uh, actually around the world who were getting Japanese yen at one price and then being able to get a higher return. Well, when this really started to go up and they started to raise interest rates in Japan, that blew all of that apart. And that's really what led to Monday's decline. 
we did go back up with the 10-year yield, and we're also declining here with the 10-year based on price. We're not looking good here with our growth to value ratios. With the Qs to S&P, discretionary to the S&P, large cap growth is underperforming large cap value. So we're going down pretty much across the board with the large caps, mid caps, and small caps. The S&P to utilities ratio continues to decline, which is also negative. We're also dropping negative with our advanced decline ratio based on price and volume. We're continuing to go up here with our staples to S&P ratio, which is negative for the S&P. So what's our outlook for Thursday? We're negative, and but we're oversold at the same time, especially in the short term. And even to a degree in the intermediate term, we will get the weekly jobless claims. That's probably going to be one of the bigger reports. And then there's this whole thing. At first, when I heard this, I'm like, wait a minute, because they were blaming last week's report on weather. It's like, well, it's not snowing. It's the middle of summer, but it was barrel. I, I, I don't know. I've never heard the name barrel before. That's what I put wine in. But anyway... That's what they're blaming a lot of this on. So they think that there may be an improvement. At least Edward Yardeni stated this, that there may be improvement in the jobless claims this week because barrel has gone over the barrel now. And we'll also get home, wholesale inventories and then all the crazy stuff going on that could end up having an impact on the markets. And then we're not going to have any economic reports on Friday of note. And here is a look at what will be happening on Thursday. Seasonality, we're neutral to positive with the Dow and S&P, where the NASDAQ is neutral to negative. So not really much of a lean either way there. Thursday is one of the more positive days. We'll see if that ends up happening. And then this is the seasonal chart that we're looking at when the incumbent president doesn't run for re-election. Things still end up being positive overall. But September is what we have to watch out for, at least on a seasonal basis. August tends to be positive. September tends to be negative. We also see August positive, September negative, according to this chart. But during an election year, August tends to do quite well. But that doesn't seem to be panning out, at least yet. So our warning signs, we're watching these defensive sectors, okay? And they are becoming more defensive. And we're wondering, is that because of an economic slowdown? And is the market getting ready for more of a decline from where we're at right now? Growth of value, discretionary to staples, they're not helping things. They're actually adding more to the negative side of things. We're still going up with the five and 10 day equity put call charts. And accumulation distribution, even though it's oversold, continues to decline. The check in money flow is also oversold, but declining. And the check in oscillator is back to going down and not necessarily oversold since it had been going up. We're negative with the S&P and NYSE McClellan oscillators and summation indexes, the Swanland Trading Oscillator, the Bullish Percent Index for the S&P, the Parabolic SAR, the Ease of Movement, which even though it ticked up, is still pretty extreme negative, the Money Flow, the Vortex, our oscillators, the Ultimate Oscillator, the Copic Curve, those are all negative, the Bullish Percent Index for the NYSE, which had just a week ago was looking really solid, is now actually negative. And then we're still getting extreme with the momentum for the NASDAQ 100. We bounced up a little bit with the bullish percent index, but we're still negative with that chart as well. Kind of a short list here. For right now, the advanced decline lines seem to be hanging in there. And the financial sector, even though it's a little bit below its 50-day moving average, is still looking pretty good there. And this that's it. That's the positive thing right now. So our conclusion, we are negative and oversold when you take everything together. That's what we're seeing in the short and intermediate term, but we're still positive in the long term. Thank you. I hope you have a really good day. I hope you found this video helpful, and I will talk to you in the next video.